Hello, I'm Ross Tangadal, Assistant Professor of English and Director of the Cornerstone Press at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. This is our fourth course on production and cover designs, which um, our students are involved in from the top down. They work with our writers and artists that the writers are interested in to craft the cover designs that we have behind us here. We have two uh, posters at the top and a bunch of our books here on the left. So our students, just like with editorial, are involved in every aspect of the design of these books. Um, we have templates using our Adobe InDesign software for the interiors. We've developed those templates over several titles. And so 90% of our production team's time is spent developing jackets and covers for books. And I think that that's a really fun topic to teach and a really fun topic um, to, to collaborate on with these students and these writers. And so today we're going to be looking at some of these jackets, sort of how they've been developed, celebrating some of our student developers or develop or our student product produce, goodness, oh, our student production team members. There it is. And also we're going to look at a few of the design covers for two of my favorite writers, Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, and sort of how book cover aesthetics work and what that means. So here we go. So where are we on the communication circuit? We're still here in the middle between author and publisher. However, we've kind of stretched out now. Um, printers, shippers, and booksellers are all part of it because once that book is developed and put out, um, all of them have a say in how it gets sold and where it gets sold. The readers too have a say, um, and that's where that dotted line comes from. One of the best pieces of advice I got and that I now give to students when it comes to design is make your book look like other books. Sometimes we're obsessed with uniqueness. We want our book to really stand out. Standing out is great, but sometimes we want our book to fit into something that consumers understand, consumers know, and consumers feel. And there's always trends that book covers follow. And sometimes it's okay to follow trends if you know what direction things are going. And so we really encourage our staff to make unique covers, but make sure that they look like other books too. They're not just completely out of left field. They have sort of a professional trade development or a, de um, a professional trade look, which is what we're always looking for. And so developing and designing the interior layout and cover of a book is what production and design is all about. Now, again, the interior stuff, um, the text, the text block margins and stuff, that stuff's really interesting. And we teach and I teach uh, those things in my spring course, English 339 um, print and publication design or book and publication design. But today we're going to talk about book jackets, which I think are really interesting. And again, our production team spends a lot of time with. So the old saying goes, you can't judge a book by its cover. But what else do you have to go on? That's my mantra. And I learned that from, from working with folks in book history and print culture. That's like book jackets are clearly something, a, a reason why you judge a book. You, you can judge a book by its cover. How else are you going to buy that book? You want that cover to really stand out and to mean something to a consumer. And so I'm going to share some of the titles that oh, we developed um, in the Cornerstone Press over the years that I think really stand out. So in the middle, we have Holding Myself Together, our newest title by 2019-2020 Wisconsin Poet Laureate Peggy Rosga, Margaret Rosga. Bree Pleasant developed the artwork for this. So that's a broken bowl, the shards at the top of the, at the, top of the um, image you can see. And we, we, we backed that out and we tried to position our text in the right place. And Colton Barr and Shelby Balwig, who are our other designers, we came up with this wonderful title, the font, the colors. Um, it really pops, and it's but it's abstract, and I think that's really important. Um, the same can be said for the one on the right, the Almost Children by Cassandra Windwalker. That is a photograph of a zoomed-in frozen windshield. That's where all those little shards come from. It looks almost microscopic. So it's wonderfully evocative. Amalia Stern, now Amalia Hansen, developed that, and we're really proud of that piece. That was our first Portage Poetry title. And then on the left here, Alicia Splinter and Ali Zamzow developed what I call kind of the paint swatch, uh, lost and found apartments design. So Heather Dubro writes found lyric poetry. Found poetry is poetry put together by things you see, you, 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 you hear, you listen, and you place them together into a poem. And it's, the, the poetry is really interesting and really great. A little more avant-garde, a little more, um, a little more non-conventional, whereas the other two are more conventional poetry collections. But we wanted to go very abstract. And so originally there was sort of a black and white typewritten aspect that we were going for. But Ali and, and Alicia came up with these paint swatches and this is a wonderful design, great collection, and I'm so proud. So students get to have, have a lot of fun with these poetry collection designs because they're more abstract. Poetry itself is a more abstract genre. And so you can see kind of the playfulness of all three of these and how much our students really enjoyed it. 
Now, these are a little more place bound, especially the ones on the right, Nothing to Lose and Great Escapes from Detroit. These are our short fiction collections for the Legacy series. So Joseph O'Malley's Great Escape from Detroit. Um, that piece of art actually is a photograph taken by a, an artist friend of his from Detroit. You can see in the background the Ambassador Bridge, which is a major part of the Detroit metropolitan skyline. Um, Nothing to Lose by Kim Sewer takes place in Wisconsin. And again, Amalia Stern took this photograph or had a friend who took this photograph and it could be kind of anywhere in Wisconsin. I love the, the, the nature of the photograph, the fog and the mist and the way that the landscape looks. It's all, um, it's very telling for how we're gonna bring us into the collection, which has a wonderful mix of sort of urban and suburban and rural um, pieces in it. And then on the left, we wanted to really break away from those first two in terms of just pure design. So Nothing to Lose 2018, Great Escapes from Detroit 2019, Responsible Adults here 2019 or 2020. Patricia Ann McNair was into thinking about the 70s as a design element, so that's what part of this was. And then um, uh, Alicia Splinter and Heidi Profson put together this sort of arrow design, which is multicolored and bright and fun and interesting. And I'm so proud of the way this one turned out. Patty actually, Patty McNair says, it's like the arrow is bringing you into the book. And I really dig that. I think that's true. So again, you can see how the, the short fiction collections differ from the poetry collections a little bit more, um, a little bit more place bound, but even responsible adults, a little more sheen to it. And I think less abstraction, more specifics. And that arrow design is wonderful in the multiple colors. And here's a couple of more titles. So The Appointed Hour here on the right was written by Suzanne Davis. This is our first legacy series short story collection. Um, it was published in 2017. And the back church steeple art was developed or was created by a student here on campus of UWSP's art department. And then all of the fonts and colors were developed by our designer that year, Richard Wilkos, who really helped us move forward with our designs. Um, a lot of his work really helped influence how we see our covers moving forward. And actually how Apertures by Robert Miltner, which is the first in our back home series, Midwestern nonfiction. Um, is really a, a child of that type of design. You can see the shapes, the, 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 the similar angles, and also the landscape, it's really important. So he had a friend or an artist friend who we wanted to look at their portfolio and saw a lot of their art and this one really stood out. And so you have a beautiful blue sort of rivers, rocks formation. It's a really interesting cover. And so we're proud of Shelby and Colton for this one and Richard for this one. And um, as you can see, we'll continue to develop these covers with our students and writers and artists um, as we move forward. So it's really fun to design covers, but look at how all of them are very much professional. There's not a lot of sort of amateurism going on here. These are carefully quality controlled and our students are so involved in making sure that these covers are exactly what we want. Um, so I'm really proud of that. So now we have in our time by Ernest Hemingway, who was one of my favorite writers and in the, in the far right, um, a cover he hated, and you can, I think you can see why. It's his book, his book's title is covered with, uh, his book's, his cover is, his cover is covered, there it is, with all of these blurbs from other people. Um, it's really off-putting. It, it almost looks like a, like a newspaper, and, and to, the, to the point where you don't know what this book is even about, you don't really know what this is. Um, in our time in the middle from 1930 is in line with sort of his um, his work in the 20s with Charles Scribner's Sons and in 1930 when he moved publishers from Bonnie and Liverite, which was the first in our time, to Charles Scribner's Sons, which is the second in our time here in the middle. Um, they kept him in line with cover designs they were doing for Fitzgerald or F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway in the 20s. And so this one by Cleon, um, it still doesn't really say much about the book. It doesn't really give you a sense of what the book is, but it's a little bit more professional. It, it's well in line with what his other books look like at that point. And then the most recent one might be the best one, um, even though I don't think there's really been a great cover of In Our Time. That's what's really funny. There's not really a great jacket for In Our Time. Ernest Hemingway's In Our Time with the two fishes in the middle. That's clearly representative of Big Too Hard River parts one and two, which is two of the final stories in the book. Um, so it's leading us like it's more of a book. Of, it's a little bit more specific. This book is about fishing. This book has fish in it. This book has you know, fish swimming around. Um, if you, a lot of the stories have to do with fishing, or at least there's there's some sort of connection to nature that I think is important. But I do like this new cover from 2021. However, you can see it's hard to put together a really good cover, especially for a short story collection. And so I want us to keep that in mind when we move forward here to have Scott Fitzgerald. And so now with F. Scott Fitzgerald, we have This Side of Paradise, which is his, his debut novel, um, Flappers and Philosophers, his follow-up, but it was a short story collection, and then his novel follow-up to This Side of Paradise, The Beautiful and Damned. Now, it's clear that 
these men all look somewhat like F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, I think that's purposeful. He was very unhappy with this one. He thought he looked very maudlin and very unhappy. And well, he kind of looks pretty unhappy. Um, however, Zelda, his, his wife, also is a clear model for the flapper girl in each of these. Um, and so artistically, they, these look very autobiographical. I love the, the, the orange color. They're all sort of unified in their own way. They all are following a trajectory. The, the, um, the font is similar on each. So clearly, the, the Charles Scribner Sons was sort of packaging Fitzgerald a certain way, and Fitzgerald wanted to be packaged a certain way. Look how there's people on all of these. And I think that's part of the social realism that he was going for. However, his more mature works, um, Tender is the Night, 1934, and The Great Gatsby, of course, 1925. The people aren't there anymore. Fitzgerald's uh, doppelganger isn't there anymore. Zelda's doppelganger isn't there anymore. Instead, we have much more abstract, much more mature pieces of art. So we have Cugat's famous painting for The Great Gatsby. We have um, the women in the eyes. We have the lips and the disembodied head of Daisy Buchanan, the main character. This looks like potentially tears coming down. Um, it's just an awesome cover, very abstract, very modern. Um, and the, and the, of course, the blue is very striking. And then I love the cover to Tender is the Night from 1934, uh, the French Riviera. Um, you've got the homes and the flowers and trees. It's, again, it's so mature. Compare these to those three earlier. They're, they're, they're so different in terms of presentation. And that goes back to one of our first classes, which is about presenting yourself. When the book gets to a certain point, the author's work is part of this book. And the book now is being presented to the public. Yet there's all of these other elements that go into putting the work out. And one of them is a jacket design or a cover design. And a lot of those times, the author doesn't have much of a say in what the cover is going to be. You could tell from the Hemingway covers, he had no say. And with Gatsby, um, Fitzgerald had a little bit of a say, tender also, but he pretty much, that was the job of the publisher to put together jackets and put the book out. And so here at the university's press, we are much more interested in, in getting the writer involved in the jacket design so that all parties are really pleased. Um, but it's, it's always fun to look at book jackets. So a couple of movie tie-in additions to The Great Gatsby. My students love these. The one on the left, of course, was by Baz Luhrmann, 2012. The movie I thought was a wonderful adaptation, but it was very loud. It was very energetic. It was very bright, very Baz Luhrmann. Um, and so the cover really, really looks like that. It's got that modern, almost like piping. And then one of the rights much more sedated, um, Robert Redford and Mia Farrow. Um, and that kind of matches with my experience with that movie version. It's, it's much more quiet. It's not as energetic and powerful as Baz Luhrmann's. Um, and so you have, again, movie tie-in editions always have sort of what, what they focus on is more the stars of the movie as opposed to the books themselves. But again, these have two very strikingly different looks. And then my absolute favorite, these are the mass market paperback editions of The Great Gatsby, some of them. So the one in the middle, The Great Gatsby, complete and unabridged. It's already a short novel, so I don't know why you would ever read an, an abridged version. Um, the famous novel of a man's ruthless drive to wealth to buy back the haunting past. Um, okay, he's not really buying Daisy. He, he, he wants to be rich so that Daisy will love him. That's what he thinks. He's going to get back to what it used to be. But my biggest problem with this cover is that, um, oops, I went the wrong way. There we go. My biggest problem with this cover is this was clearly produced in the 1950s. I mean, um, our Daisy looks much more like Grace Kelly from the 1950s, which again is not period specific at all. And also it sure looks like Jay Gatsby is well into his 40s, uh, a little bit more middle age. He looks like Philip Baker Hall, the famous character actor. Um, this doesn't really fit with what we're, what our book is about or what the book is going to be. So I always find this cover in particular very interesting. Plus, Tender is the Night is styled wrong. The is should be capitalized. Uh, the one on the right, The Great Gatsby, and another movie tie-in edition, Alan Ladd starring as Jay Gatsby. Um, my problem with this one, it kind of gives the kind of gives the story away. I mean, um, spoiler alert, if you haven't read The Great Gatsby, you know, something happens to Gatsby at the end. And so it's kind of interesting to put, you know, the ending uh, on the cover of the book. Um, that would, that's kind of problematic if you ask, if you ask this publisher. Um, I don't think you'd want to um, give away too much. But the ultimate, the best, pun intended, The Great Gatsby, when it came to loving, he knew which daisy to pick. I mean, we've got some malls here. We've got um, sort of a Jay Gatsby as noir detective. We have what looks like the Adams Family house in the background. 
boy, if I could recreate this cover, I'd do it all day. But yeah, he knew which daisy to pick. So my students really get a kick out of these. And again, it shows you the different audiences. These are all being sold for very little money, 50 cents, 75 cents, you know, 25 cents. These are small little paperbacks that are just going out in train stations, grocery stores, and they're being produced very quickly and very cheaply, which is why you can see they're almost more salacious. The others are much more esteemed. I mean, if you look at these, these aren't going to be sold in in you know mass market form. These are these are trade editions. Even with these, you can see how much more refined these are. So, with that, my friends, um, that brings us to the end of our production and book design uh, book covers. Again, I teach whole courses on these topics, so it, it, it's hard for me to put this into a 10 to 15 minutes um, you know, lecture. But I hope you get a sense of what it is that we're doing here with book designs and book jackets, and how covers have they have such a they play such an important role in what a book is and what a book will become. So for our next uh, meeting, we'll be talking about marketing and sales, particularly, um, particularly marketing, how marketing materials um, sort of help sell books or what they mean for books and sort of how certain books have been marketed in the past. And so I hope you've been enjoying the class. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. And we will see you next time.